And as for the strong expressions that are made use of in the National Covenant, tis plain that they were designed by the framers of it as a rail to debar such as they say were stirred up by Satan and that Roman Antichrist to promise, swear, etc., and for a time to use the holy sacraments in the kirk deceitfully, minding thereby under the external cloak of religion to corrupt and subvert secretly God's true religion within the kirk. And, if, after all, any should wickedly presume to break in over the rail, the sin should lie at their door, and this bold presumption should be an aggravation of their heinous guilt, or, as it is expressed in the covenant, their double condemnation in the day of the Lord Jesus. The above observation, taken from Petri's history, may help to take off the force of some other exceptions that are laid by our author against the national covenant. As for this instance, essay, page 110, he tells us, quote, that some sundry, yea, many among the most judicious, are of opinion the National Covenant ought to be rectified not only by explications, but by some alterations, and, to name but in one particular, tis said, they cannot see how any else but real, assured converts or believers can take the National Covenant, none but such as have what is called sensible reflex assurance, unquote. It is plain that our author is amongst the some or many who start the above difficulty against the National Covenant. Otherwise, when he mentions the said difficulty, he should have been at pains to satisfy these most judicious persons who have moved it. The objection, then, that our author makes against the National Covenant is that none but assured converts or believers, and such who have sensible reflex assurance, can take the National Covenant. Here I might ask our author, May not a true believer be assured and persuaded of the truths of the gospel, and yet at the same time be in the dark about his own interest in Christ, or what he calls sensible reflex assurance? And also it might be inquired if there can be any reflex assurance, but what is in some degree or other sensible. But not to insist upon this, I shall consider what is offered by our author to prove that, quote, none but such as have what is called sensible reflex assurance can take the national covenant, unquote. This, says he, they cannot do, quote, in regard to the takers and swearing, say, after long and due examination of our consciences in matter of true and false religion, we are now thoroughly resolved in the truth by the word and spirit of God, unquote. But there is nothing in these expressions which are contained in the preamble to our national covenant that gives the least ground for the difficulty above mentioned. The subject of the thorough resolution mentioned in the above words of the covenant is not one's particular personal interest in Christ, but matters of true and false religion. And may not one be fully assured or thoroughly persuaded with respect to the truth and matters of true and false religion, though they have not a sensible reflex assurance concerning their own personal interest in Christ? For it is this assurance, I suppose, is meant by such who move the difficulty. And I judge that these sundry or many judicious persons who have moved the above objection against the covenant have not duly considered the above words of our national covenant on which the difficulty is grounded, in regard the objection that they move upon this head against our national covenant amounts to this, that none can be thoroughly resolved in their own consciences in matters of true and false religion if they have not an assurance of their personal interest in Christ. And I suppose this will be looked upon as dangerous as well as a as erroneous conclusion. In regard, it would make true believers, while they want sensible reflex assurance, skeptics in matters of true and false religion. What it is added in the preamble to the covenant, quote, that they are thoroughly resolved in the truth by the word and spirit of God, unquote. Neither does this infer the necessity of what our author calls sensible reflex assurance, and that because such as are only temporary believers may be resolved in the truth of matters of true and false religion by the word and the common operations of the spirit of God. I doubt not, but it may be said of those mentioned in the parable, Matthew, 23, uh, Matthew 13, excuse me, verse 20, who heard the word and anon with joy received it and yet fell away, that they were resolved in the truth with respect to matters of true and false religion, and therefore even such who are neither converts nor assured converts and believers may express themselves in the above words of our national covenant. Yea, further, such as have only what is called a mere historical faith may be resolved in their own consciences in the truth with respect to matters of true and false religion both by the word and by the common strivings of the Spirit of God with their own consciences, and therefore might take the national covenant and warrantably express themselves in the above manner. Tis here likewise to be observed that after the truth had been overclouded, 
with anti-Christian darkness, it did break forth with a very plentiful effusion of the spirit which the Lord brought his church and people in this land out of anti-Christian darkness, as also there was in the year 1638, a more than ordinary effusion of the spirit upon all ranks of persons in this land, as I have already observed. Under this plentiful effusion of the spirit, many were savingly enlightened, Others had a common enlightening work of the Spirit of God in matters that concern the difference betwixt true and false religion, and therefore might warrantably swear, not only in the above terms contained in the preamble, but also might say, quote, that they were persuaded in their consciences through the knowledge and love of God's true religion, imprinted in their hearts by the Holy Spirit, unquote. And though many at this time were savingly enlightened, yet there is no doubt that others were only under a common enlightening work of the Spirit, and therefore fell away. They proved unsteadfast and perfidious in his covenant. And this was likewise the case with Israel in the wilderness, who swore with as great solemnity to the Lord as ever Scotland did. And yet with many of them, God was not well pleased. 1 Corinthians 10.5 I must further observe, with respect to the above strong expressions contained in the covenant, that they are agreeable to the scripture rule for such solemn actions, such as Jeremiah 4 verse 2. And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. These words of the prophet do plainly point that the swearing or covenanting of nations unto the Lord, and the above expressions in our national covenant are expressly laid against these who sheltered themselves under dispensations from Rome, and who dealt deceitfully against their own consciences in the matters of God. Therefore our covenanting fathers declare that they swear in truth or in sincerity, being resolved in their own consciences in the truth, with respect to matters of true and false religion by the word and spirit of God. This is said in opposition to the above hypocritical deceivers. Again, they declare, they swear in righteousness and judgment, being persuaded in their own consciences, quote, through the knowledge and love of God's true religion on imprinted in their hearts by the Holy Spirit, unquote. This is, likewise, uh, this is said likewise in opposition to such as were guilty of hypocrisy and double dealing with God and his kirk, as also a blind implicit faith, or the general doubt, doubt form, doubt, oh, doubtsome, I'm sorry, doubtsome faith of the Church of Rome is hereby condemned. As for the other expressions of our national covenant, from which our author likewise argues that a sensible reflex assurance is needful in such as would swear the national covenant, that is, quote, to this true reformed kirk we join ourselves willingly in doctrine, faith, religion, discipline, and use of the holy sacraments as lively members of the same in Christ our head, unquote. The difficulty is chiefly founded upon the last words, as lively members, etc. And for clearing of this difficulty I observe, that as the Lord Jesus is given to be head over all things unto the church which is his body, so this glorious and exalted head may be viewed under a double consideration, and so may his body, the church. First, the church may be considered as it is his believing and mystical body. Secondly, as it is a visible professing body, to the church considered as his believing mystical body, the Lord Jesus is not only the head of rule and government, but he is in a special manner the head of all gracious, saving, and spiritual influences, whereby they are quickened and sanctified and preserved unto his heavenly kingdom. Their unction is from this Holy One, who communicates his spirit unto all the members of his mystical body, according to their different measures. Again, if the church is considered as a visible professing body, he is both the head of rule and government, and also of the communication of all these spiritual gifts, not only such as are saving, but also of all these common gifts and graces, whereby all the members of the visible body are, in their several spheres and stations, adapted and made serviceable unto the whole, unto the good of the whole body. Excuse me. First Corinthians twelve fourteen through twenty four. Further. When the church is viewed as the believing mystical body of Christ, she is then considered as under the internal dispensation of the grace of the covenant. Again, when the church is viewed as a visible professing body, she is then considered as under the external administration of the covenant of grace, making an outward credible profession of the truths of the gospel, and giving an outward subjection unto the ordinances of Christ, particularly the government and discipline of his house. I observe in the first section of the first chapter that though every particular church stands in relation under the Catholic, Catholic body as, part of, as a part under the whole, 
Yet every particular church, whether national or presbyterial, may be considered as a visible body, in respect of its own members, order, and government. And it is very obvious and plain that when our Reforming Fathers declare their conjunction with this true Reformed Kirk in doctrine, faith, religion, discipline, etc., no more can be meant but their conjunction with this Reformed Church as an outward, visible, organical body, making an outward profession of the true faith and professing subjection under the ordinances of divine institution and appointment. And when they declare themselves lively members of the professing visible body of uh, body in Christ their head, no more can be intended than the sincerity of their profession in opposition unto the dead and corrupt members of Antichrist their head, who were only moved from worldly respects, as it is expressed in our confession of faith, and who under the external cloak of religion, by virtue of the Pope's dispensations, subverted secretly God's true religion and when their time did serve them, became open enemies and persecutors of the same. Under the vain hope of the said dispensations, devised, as is likewise expressed in the National Covenant, against the word of God, to the Pope's great confusion, and the double condemnation of all such his followers in the day of the Lord Jesus, hence the reader may see, that when our covenanters swear, as lively members of this Reformed Church in Christ their head, it is not that vital union betwixt Christ the head and the mystical body, that is here mainly intended, but it is that outward visible conjunction as members of the same visible organic body under Christ the head of the church that is here principally intended. And therefore, when they declare themselves lively members of the said body, no more can be meant but their profession was not that dead, rotten, hypocritical, and deceitful profession with the design to subvert the true religion, which severals of the popish party made. Hence they add, quote, we, therefore, willing to take away all suspicion of hypocrisy and of such double dealing with God and his kirk, call the searcher of all hearts for witness that our minds and our hearts do fully agree with this our confession, promise, oath, and subscription. Unquote. From what is above observed, I hope the reader may see that there is no ground for that objection which our author tells us many among the most judicious make against the national covenant, as also that the covenant may be sworn in its genuine sense and meaning, even by such who have not what our author calls sensible reflex assurance. Our author makes another objection against the National Covenant, page 185, that is, quote, Might not some serious souls, having a full sensible assurance, being persuaded the believer is beyond all danger of hell, had a scruple to swear to do so and so under the danger of both body and soul in the day of God's fearful judgment, which are the words of that covenant, unquote, he adds, quote, If I mistake not, most part of the seven brethren, sometime since 1722, would had a scruple to swear in the above terms, unquote. To which our answer, to which I answer, excuse me, our author is very much mistaken, for all the seceding brethren may safely swear the covenant in the above terms without any scruple. I hope our author will not allege against any of them that they have departed from the doctrine laid down in our Confession of Faith, and they cheerfully own the sixth article of the 19th chapter of our Confession of Faith, as well as the other articles of that Confession. That is, quote, Although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works, to be thereby justified or condemned, yet it is of great use to them, as well as others, and the threatenings of it severe, to show what even their sins deserve, unquote. Does not every oath contain either explicitly or implicitly a solemn appeal to God, not only as a witness but also as the judge and avenger in case of perfidy or false swearing. Our author is amongst the some who scruple at the National Covenant on account of the above awful certification in its bosom. He is not far from the principles of the Quakers and German Anabaptists who affirm that it is not lawful to swear any oaths whatsoever. I proceed now to consider what is advanced by our author against the constitute members of the Assembly, 1638. He makes mention of a great many oaths that were imposed before 1638, though I have not observed that any of them were imposed either by civil or ecclesiastic authority, nay, not by the pretended assemblies of that period. I do not pretend to know what the lawless High Commission did. And, after he has reckoned up his oaths, he tells us in essay, page 92, I suppose the ministers of that assembly, 1638, for a great part, were men who had sworn and come under these oaths, unquote. 